Uh, yeah, welcome back to Roman's Christmas. Um, this is a visual novel, uh, and we have just been regaled with a bunch of information from Anzox about a crime that didn't really happen. This is still the tutorial. Let's look at our clues so far. So, we know that there was a miller um, who was hung upside down on a stopped windmill, and we have a bunch of clues that may or may not be red herrings. We also have a little bit of <clears throat> my dinner stuck in the back of my throat. Sorry. Very unprofessional. Noticing the detective's approach, Elena sat upright with Hans's support, her eyes drooping. She was dressed in a light blue, light blue night dress. Her eyes were red and swollen. Her facial fur was combed, and it was easy to see the state of disorder despite her attempts to cover it. Anzox coughed a few times, and when he spoke to him, it was in a higher than a voice. Are you kidding? Welcome, Mr. Detective! I assume this visit is related to my father's death! It'd be nice if you could talk this way more often. Would it? It's really hard to speak like this. Come on, show us your dedication to your craft. Jesus Christ, you so can't see so much I juice. Those are tears. I know now why you cry. Ooh. It took the detective about ten minutes to persuade the apprentice to go upstairs with his servant, lest one of their testimonies influence each other. This is the servant now? After formally introducing himself in some brief preparation, the detective asked her to tell the story of that night. Testimony. Testimony of Elena the First. Yesterday, after dinner, my father went to the tavern as usual. I finished my housework after about 8 o'clock. It was about two hours before my father came back. Nothing seemed strange. I then went up to Hans's room to chat with him. Two hours passed by, and we didn't realize that my father had yet to return as normal. It wasn't until about 11 o'clock that we realized how late it really was. I hurried downstairs, thinking my father was quietly sitting in the living room, Ready to scold me, but he wasn't there. The door was closed, and no one was in the living room. I had a feeling that something terrible must have happened. It was like a snake had slithered under the door and crawled up my spine to whisper in my ear. I don't know if it was because of the wind or the old hinges, but the door on that day was a little more difficult to open than usual. I pushed the door open, and the wind blew the snow into the house. I popped the door open and made my way outside. When I got onto the windmill, I had a strange thought, like an itch on my back that cannot be scratched, and I couldn't help but look up. Hanging above my head was a purple face that was swollen and swaying in the wind. His eyes were as prominent as goldfishes. Saliva had flowed down his open, screaming mouth and frozen into ice on his snout and fur. What? <clears throat> How dang cold was it? I was frightened, so I rushed back into the house and closed the door. I couldn't see... Oh, shit. I just realized. I thought the windmill and the, the house that the Miller family lived in were one building. I guess that makes more sense why the detective had to walk outside. Yeah. I couldn't sleep afterwards. You didn't report it? I could still see that face. I couldn't believe it was my father. Wait, what? Why didn't she fucking tell anybody? No, what? Hang on. I was frightened, so I rushed back to the house, closed the door, and then I went to bed. Sus. As she finished her description of the horrible situation, Elena collapsed on the sofa with her hands covering her face. <gasps> At this time, the detective smelled something fishy in her testimony. After a thorough thought of her testimony, the detective found the irreconcilable contradiction between the testimony and the evidence. What evidence contradicts Elena's testimony? Uh, good question. The fact that she's sus as fuck. My father went to the tavern as usual. I finished my housework at about 8 o'clock. It was about two hours before my father came back. Nothing seemed strange. So the father came back at 10... Oh, okay, so this this two hours and this two hours, that's the same two hours. So she finished her chores, went upstairs to talk to Hans. Now it's 10 o'clock. And... 
Now it's 11. Is that right? Is it? So either we're missing an hour or we have an extra hour. Uh, let's see. Okay, so he was at the tavern around 8 o'clock. Or was he? Is this what you're talking about? I mean, that's the only one that's referring to the Miller's Apprentice. Two hours in the room alone, you expect them to leave it just chatting. Give me no rich life experience. I think you know what I really mean, Roman. Oh, yeah. Oh, but I got extra information about... Okay. So, maybe maybe part of the gameplay loop is... If I don't make a drastically incorrect deduction, I get an additional clue by further investigating that particular thing, even if it's wrong. I think she is a fibber that is telling me a lie. Did I already do the footprints? I think I did the footprints. Footprints. Hey, music! The paradox is... No other footprints on the scene. Right, because there was a jumble of footprints in the clue. It was stated only the only one series of footprints on the site reached the gate of the mill. Since Elena got out, she would have certainly left her footprints as well. I don't know how she did it. Lena must have con concealed something. As for the reason, I can we can only go on with the inquiry. Ugh. After all, contradictions can't be based on conjecture. Yeah. What what is that what is that trope called? Uh, conviction based on contrafactual point, or just showing something's wrong? Yeah, I do need neon flashing letters because the clue I thought her inability to do basic arithmetic with time was not the clue that was important to the story. And also, he both came back and didn't come back in two sentences. The detective tidied his sleeves and carefully pointed out the errors in Elena's testimony. I don't know. Um, as I recall, Miss Elena, you said you went to check outside. Yes! Then why is there only one set of footprints from the outside of the house to the gate of the mill? Well, I must have been so scared that my memory is confused. I mean, that's fair. L let me start over. The testimony of Elena the First, corrected. Yesterday, after dinner, my father went to the tavern as usual. I went f upstairs for Hans to, to chat. Two hours passed by and there was no sign of my father's return. Okay, so eight to ten. I went downstairs around 11 and found the- See? Look! There's the missing hour again! I opened the door and my father's distorted head appeared as the body swung outside. What? <laughs> she's, got, she's got telescope eyes now. <laughs> what is that I see? Way in the distance over there! A corpse! I was so scared that I ran back to the house and closed the door. See, I was so frightening that my memory is confused. Good night, every time I closed my eyes, my face would pop up. I couldn't sleep at all. As long as a lie is told, more lies are bound to be used to cover it up. It is a pity that even the most talented folk can't make up every lie perfectly, let alone under such pressure. Miss Elena! There's really no need to hide anything from me! Even the detective saw through the lies she made up this time. What evidence contradicts her testimony? The time! The time! The time is going to be doing a bit. From 8 o'clock to 11 o'clock, which saw the middle of the, day of the door, she was so frightened. He's at the windmill, though. I really hope that the game is inferring that I mean the position of the body on the windmill, not the position of the body upside down. How could Elena see the head in the door if the miller's paws were even with the windmill's blade? Elena saw what she could not have seen, only because she was accidentally out there and cleaned up her footprints when she came back. Uh, not to mention cleaning up her footprints is suspicious. Why would you need to clean up her footprints if you're just a witness? Perhaps she panicked and this is something that would implicate herself accidentally. The whole scene she describes as some sort of delusion. That could be true. As, uh, as you said, you saw the face of the deceased in the door. This is definitely impossible for you with the current position of the body. Corpses don't simply move after death, do they? How could... I don't even know! Get off my ass! Lena screamed hysterically and ran out of the living room. It seemed that uh, you couldn't go near her for a while. So the detective went upstairs to visit another witness, Hans, and saved the game. The detective saw Hans upstairs. Oh boy, he was wearing a soft hat. A burlap jacket and brown linen trousers. The dark gray eyes under the brim made the detective uncomfortable for some reason. That kind of look reminded him of a colleague he had met in another case several years before. A wolf with beautiful blue eyes that had an unruly and wild gaze. 
Don't, don't push it, you. Calm down, man. As I started to get up, I was pressed back in my seat by Sarsen's sick claws. So it's still so in the concert between customers. Five years ago, someone made the mistake of starting a fight in a tavern. He grabbed the guy with one paw and threw him across the street. Some others attracted more customers. I still don't know what they're thinking. Are they all masochists? As the detective did not it, noticed not that the hair on his paw seemed to be darker than elsewhere. The detective face remained unchanged. He lowered his hat to cover his spying eyes. Mr. Hans, I hope you don't mind. I'm just doing my job. The detective sat in the wooden chair opposite of Hans and handed his cane to the servant behind him. More servants! I would like to hear more, uh, I would like to hear about what happened last night. So straightforward, Mr. Detective. Well, I will try my best. That's not the accent we're going to use. Oh, God. I just went with Hans. That's many of Hans the first. Uh, I don't know. Yesterday, after dinner, like every ordinary night, the miller went to the pub to pass the time. Elena and I stayed in the mill to watch the house. We stayed in the room until 11 o'clock and found out that the miller didn't come back at his usual time. Elena went downstairs to check while I hurried back to my room. It wasn't long before I heard Elena screaming downstairs at the sound of the door being slammed. I went downstairs and saw Elena piled and slumped on the ground. I took her back to her room. Show me off and on about what she saw outside the door. I stayed at her, at her bedside all night to keep my company. Okay, just one question. Did she close the door? Mm -hmm. That's options. She did close the door. Well, she didn't say anything about him moving around, so that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> was that a glass shatter? Somebody was like, hey, fuck this detective, he sucks! I guess alibi. I mean, that's pretty shitty. So what's the proof of their alibi? Can't they prove each other's alibi? No, not without a corro not without trusted corroborating evidence. What if they collude? It doesn't count if two people prove each other's absence. Is that so? Is there anything suspicious? Um, room? Testimony is contradictory about the room. Obviously, the wording seems to be a little subtle. What about it? Uh, did they go to two different rooms? Is that what you're saying? I think their testimonies jive. <coughs> but it might be the, um, wait, what is Char? Oh, that's me! Oh, shit. <laughs> so it closes at 11 p.m. It takes them an hour to get home? It takes them an hour to get home? Is that what you're saying? It takes them an hour? An hour to get home? An hour to get home? Is that what you're saying? Now let's go to different rooms. Elena said she went to Hans' room to chat with him, but Hans' testimony just now seems to mention he went back to my room. It may not be the same room. Seems like one of them forgot the prepared testimony in haste. Mr. Hans, I have a small question. It has nothing to do with the case, and more of me being jealous old soul, soul face with two young lovers. In which room do you usually date in? Uh, well, in Elena's room. If that were the case, then Alina's testimony contradicts yours. She told me you two were in your room as usual. Oh, really? She must be confused by the show. Or was she so frightened that she forgot the alibi you agreed on in advance? What are you talking about? I don't even know. What are you talking about? Hans kept fiddling with his hands, and the fine beads of sweat moistened the short hairs on his forehead. His gray eyes avoided the detective's gaze. Oh, please excuse me, Mr. Hans. This is my speculation, after all. Okay. But I wouldn't choose a partner who gets nervous easily if I were you. Ah, oh, your hands shake when you're nervous. Can you even grasp the rope with those? The detective could read Hans' sense behavior like a book. And now he need only a little physical evidence to prove his conjecture. They went out to the snowfield where the body had been lowered from the windmill by a servant. The miller's body was spread out in the snow so anyone can see it. As the detective inspected the now neatly arranged cor- Cor? Couldn't help but grimace. After reprimanding the sign, we carelessly moved the body and went to investigate it. Search start. We see the place we want to investigate the picture. Oh, cool. Uh, well, his neck wasn't broken. What this? He put on his gloves, pulled aside the miller's coat, and revealed his thick fur. He could feel the liquefying fat under the miller's skin. The miller looked like quite plump thanks to his wealthy life. Is this even related to the case? Don't add so many pointless details to the case. Who knows? Perhaps it may be relevant somehow. His eyes aren't bloody. The detective looked closely at his face. He was scared by the dead Miller's twisted face, even though it wasn't the first time seeing a body. 
Mel's wide open eyes were growing cloudy and lifeless. His wrinkles were getting clearer due to his stiff facial muscles. His mouth stayed shut. The silent fear still escaped from it. He had been greatly frightened. Mel's fur remained fluffy, with no sign of strange marks. Hey, shouldn't his head be all swollen and filled with blood because he was upside down? All the blood would like congeal in his head. Let's look at this. Mel's ankle was tied with safety rope, cheap but reliable. The knot was a hangman's noose. And there he plants the solid rope. I'm not a merchant! What this? The detective looked at his curl of fingers and found gray fur inside his nails, which matched his own fur color. Under the miller's fur on his chest, there were scratches. He got up and finished the search. Now he knew what had happened. He did? Now let's put the pieces together. Wait, there's still a lot of questions to be solved. Didn't you take notes for the evidence? Take a good look. Hmm, it seems the main problems of this case lie the cause of the Miller's death, the weapon that killed him, whether he was murdered, and the killer's motive. The process of how the case happened is also noteworthy. If it's impossible to confirm the sequence of events, we should focus on the factors that change with time, such as weather. What the heck? What is this? What am I supposed to click on? The weapon. It's just a thematic thing, start with them. Okay. What's your opinion of the murder weapon? What's the murder weapon? Couldn't be a knife or a stone because there was no external injuries. I don't know what you mean by twine. I guess they're referring to like a garrote. It's a shock. Maybe it's an invisible weapon. Interested. How about murdering him with a shock which caused by the sudden drop? Not everyone would be so easily scared as you are. But anyone would be shocked if they were hung without any preparation. A, lone dr a drunk, overweight Miller. Indeed, I suppose sudden death could be possible because of these external factors. Seems like, though, this time the detail wasn't just to add dramatic flair. Of course, every detail is necessary. So I take nearly half an hour to describe the suspect's <laughs> I think it would have been poison, right? Like, poison makes more sense, I guess? Because he would have been like, Ah, no, it's burning my chest! Ah, I'm dying here! The method. The modus operandi. What's the process of crime? Detective Reason arranges the occurrence chronologically from top to bottom by dragging... Okay. I like the little bedding thing, that's nice. The Miller's neck? These are not the things that I would use to <laughs> to detail the crime. If the rope had ever been on the Miller's neck, we would have seen rope burns in his fur. Okay, so let's assume it was the daughter, right? She goes up to the windmill, goes up goes upstairs, takes the rope out of the maintenance basket, and drops it on the ground outside. From from the upper area. Right? And then See, the phrasing of this sentence is too passive for me to really parse correctly. The rope hitched to the miller's ankle. It, if it's inferring the killer hitched the rope to the miller's ankle, then it would go here. But if it's implying that it's an accident, then it would be like this. Where the rope fell down and then it hitched around his ankle. But I think what it's infer what it's implying is this. A hangman's noose. But it wasn't a noose. They specifically say, yeah, it's it's tied in a hangman's noose, but it wasn't tied around his neck in a hangman's noose. I think it looks like that, but I might be wrong. There are four chips in their positions. Chronological, you can manage your thought about the case. Touch the bottom and place your bet without hesitation. Easy peasy. Okay, so four of these are right. I think it was on the ground and he stepped into it and then he was pulled up. <gasps> like a snare trap! The suspect didn't run away. So like that. 
So she waited for him to step into the snare trap. And then... Why would she burn the wedge keeping the windmill in position if she could just pull it out? Seems right. Luck may have been component, but it's not impossible. The motive. It was love. It was love. The motive's love. Obviously. Young love. Let's talk about the motive then. First of all, we've already established that Miller got along well with the villagers. So what could the motivation for murder be? What's the possible motive? Love. 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 Miller wouldn't allow the relationship between his daughter and their apprentice. You mean someone murdered him so the pair could be together? Yes, one of the pair! Where you pay attention, Elegon! Come on! It's unnecessary to kill him just because of a disagreement, though. So that means something recently happened to provoke the culprit into killing the Miller quickly. Then the identity of the criminal is obvious. Even so, there's no need to kill him. Who's the culprit? I think it's obvious now. The criminal is... We know Elena was the one that pulled the trigger, but I think it was both of them. Because, because... When Hans, when, when the detective went to Hans and said, Yo, your story don't match up to Elena's. Hans wasn't like, what the fuck are you talking about? Hans was like, oh, uh, 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 uh I, don't, I don't know. It's so super weird. What did Elena say? It was both of them. Yep, they share the common benefit in the operation. The trap needs cooperation. Dunzo! Then the whole picture of this case is crystal clear. How come you're so excited since you aren't the one to solve the puzzle? I'm just excited to see you work, okay? So the whole story of the case is... Flashback. The Miller was a nice guy, but he was particularly picky about his daughter relationship, especially the relationship with his apprentice. But even he couldn't stop their love from blossoming. The two young people seized every moment they got to be together. And this situation had been going on for a while. As eager as they were to be open with their relationship, they couldn't bear the Miller's denial of their love any longer. All of a sudden, the Miller made an important decision. That is... Oh... When you say betrothed his daughter, you mean to someone else, right? The Miller had picked out a satisfactory candidate amongst his daughter's suitor to announce an announce decision to her. Yeah, okay, so that's who we're talking <laughs> To someone else, right? This ambiguous syntax is going to be the end of me. The Miller thought he had arranged a good marriage. Naturally, his special generosity made his acquaintances of the Tamarins extremely enthusiastic. Which is why they decided to kill the Miller that night. The lovers were supposed to escape that night after they finished the deed, but the heavy snow and another accident forced them to change their plan. After the middle went out, Hans set a noose with the safety rope and lowered it down from the third floor maintenance gondola. By the way, the noose is a method used to hang murderers. Their original plan might have been for Elena to meet the miller on the first floor, put the knot hanging from the windmill around his neck. Then Elena sent to signal to Hans and let him pull the rope up to hang the miller. But even the calmest people make a costly mistake when they kill for the first time. At around 10 o'clock, Hans, whose Hans shook when he got nervous, lost his grip on the rope and dropped the knot in the snow, leaving the circular imprint. Elena, who had just opened the door and was ready to greet her father, saw the noose fall to the ground. She probably wanted to warn Hans to take it back, but the miller was already close by then. It would attract the miller's attention if the rope was pulled back up. The murder attempt should have failed by that point, but by sheer coincidence, the miller took a wrong step to change the whole thing. She just knelt down and tied it to him? Oh no. Yeah, it was, yeah, yeah like the tiger trap. He stepped into the noose by accident. At that time, Hans had just grabbed his rope outside the maintenance gondola. When the miller's paw moved forward in the snow, the rope was pulled. Hans felt the pull and instinctively pulled the rope according to the original plan, pulling the miller up by his ankle. The miller fell in the snow which was full in the air, leaving nasty marks in, the f in front of his footprints as he struggled. Hans hung the miller in the air, dared not to go of the rope and let him struggle in the air. Oh, that's where he did the... That's where he did the... Oh, no. yeah. After a while of struggling and cursing, the face of the miller changed from red to purple. Somehow we could see this, even though he had fur on his face. 
and more and more blood rushed to his head, his movements being weaker and weaker until they stopped. Ilana and Hans wanted to escape after this comedy of success, but finally decided to disguise the scene as if the miller had accidentally died and planned their testimonies. After all, as long as they got rid of the suspicion of the murder, they could inherit the mill. The reward for taking such a risk was extremely good. Hans tied the safety rope to the maintenance gondola, pretending that the miller had tied the rope himself. However, it had snowed by that time. The rope tied to the fence pushed the snow off, therefore there was no snow on the right side. He also struck a wooden wedge of the windmill gear to make the windmill stop spinning. As the distant villagers saw the windmill stop, they would naturally think the miller had accidentally fell and died while repairing the windmill. The morning the detective arrives was suddenly windless. The windmill wouldn't spin even without the wooden wedge stuck in. This was his chance to throw the wedge into the bread stove and destroy the evidence. Then all he needed to do was go back to his room and wait until dawn. If you don't look closely at the scene, you'd think that the miller died by accident. Although it looks intriguing at first, it's actually a novice puzzle with many loopholes. Next time, I'll give the legendary detective Roman a much more difficult puzzle. After the long investigation, the detective told everyone his inference is in the tavern and left the final decision to the villagers. The snow stopped. The detective opened the door of the snow-covered tavern. Thick snow still covered the paved road, and the detective set foot on the road home. It's late. Looks like there won't be any more customers tonight, so I'm going to close up. If you need anything, please come to the third floor to find me. Tarzan gave me and Elegant the room keys, closed the tavern, and went upstairs. Then perhaps it's time for me to go upstairs. I dare not risk being locked out if, by Tarzan if it's too late. There are three beds in the attic. Tarzan usually has two beds for himself. What? So he can have enough space to stretch his limbs. Third bed usually rented a low-priced acquaintance as new accommodations on a tight budget. This is Anzox. Elegant and I sat at the same time table, staring at each other silently. Is there anything else to do tonight? I guess we'll talk to Elegant. I'm going to talk more with Elegant. She's very interesting. Before I can move, Elegant move the chair to get closer. Actually, the puzzle is not complete yet. Isn't it? Whether it's the murder, the motive, or the method of committing the crime, they're all solved. Is there something else? Of course. The judgment. That doesn't matter, does it? Detectives can use their authority to influence the outcome of the case. For example, if it was intentional homicide, negligent homicide, or just an unfortunate accident. What the detective says will, in the end, determine the judgment. You're wrong. Every detective that earns this position will swear is loyal to the truth. I, yeah, that's true. I mean... The different degrees of murder do do count different. No, it's not even murder. That's man. That'd be like murder, murder two, murder one, and manslaughter. And that same truth is determined by the detective, is it not? For example, in this case, you believe they killed the miller by accident, or they killed the miller intentionally? Well, there's one to intimidate the miller into canceling the engagement. Uh, what is your judgment? If I were the detective, I would tell the villagers. I mean, look, they're young. The two of them are young kids in the passion, the, the passionate throes of young love, right? So, yeah, it's kind of a boneheaded scheme to be like, what if we just killed my dad? Yuck, yuck, yuck. <laughs> lol, lol, lol. <laughs> but, but what if, ha, 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 ha. What if, what if. You were Minecraft Steve, and I was a homicide. Ha ha ha, ha ha ha, unless. But you don't accidentally make a hangman's news. That's not something you slip into doing. It wasn't something that was shown on the actual, like, comic pages, but it, the narration specifically mentioned that it was a hangman's news, which is fairly complicated to make. So, yeah, they were premeditating to kill him. It's homicide. I would say it's murder. Is that not too arbitrary? The aims to stop the engagement, which is not enough to kill for. I think it's enough. Killing is something that needs special reasons. Even the most trivial things can drive someone to kill. Not exactly my logic, but sure. Besides, the way they committed the crime. Now we're talking. Oh, sorry. Besides, the way they committed the crime. Sorry, I, I read your line by accident. I had to take my glasses off for a second. I think they just failed in their original plan and chose another way. Perhaps. Finish the rest of my beer. Look, okay, if you intend to, if you set everything up to commit a murder and then end up committing a different murder with that same setup, 
it's still premeditated murder. You still put everything into place to facilitate the murder happening. So you planned ahead to make that all occur. It's not like, it's not like the, if it had been like the, the apprentice and the miller were speaking to each other on top of the incompetent murder in the first degree. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That, that's the case. It, it's not like the miller and the, the, the apprentice were like on top of the windmill, right? And the apprentice was like, I can't believe you, you know, you, you're giving, you're giving your job away to somebody who's not me. I'm the most important person in the world. And the miller like stormed off and slipped on a patch of ice and then fell off and died. That would be, that would mean like the, the kid would be completely not culpable for that. But because he was like, we're making a noose. That bar none is like reason enough to be like, look, he intended to kill him. Oh, great detective. You can really drink a lot. I'm a cliched character in that regard. It's not like I'm drowning liquor. Doesn't matter what I have a cup or two. Point to the side or she only a sip up in front of her. That's the eating reason just now. It's definitely not something a drunk could come up with. And I'll take that as a compliment. By the way, a quick tip for you. I approached her and said, Your clothes look a little bit out of place in tavern. Everyone's going to notice a teetotaling nun in the middle of a group of drunks. You're planning on staying here. I'm afraid you just end up scaring away the target of your investigation. What? I see. An amateur mistake on my part. Elegant hesitates for a while and turns to look at me. Thank you for reminding me. Ah, you're welcome. So I turned to, you know, you really are investigating something here. I guess I'm right. You're not entirely wrong. But it's not too late to change my clothes. I have to think about it. I'll play this afterwards. I'm gonna be not. I'm gonna not be a nun. I'm gonna be a mechanic. Elegant, who had been confident until now, seemed to become nervous as she gazed at the reflection of the book. She's <laughs> she's nun forty-seven. That's amazing. We have a moment. I'd like to find some time to hear what you're actually doing here. It's late. I'm going to bed. Good night. So goodbye to Elegant. Went upstairs to my room. Okay. Ah, oh, is that the end of this chapter? My room was the first on the right. Please. I'm surprised that Tarzan already cleaned the guest room and pack a blade. Maybe I was too drunk. I got my boots and flopped on the bed. Almost dreaming when I touched the pillow. Okay. That's the that's the tutorial. <laughs> Using stando power. Um, that's the tutorial of Roman's Christmas. Holy moly. Um, in my dreams, I could hear a restless place. Okay, we're done with this. Uh, we are, we are finished with this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please remember to follow me on Twitch, subscribe to me on YouTube, hit that bell. Oh, for more videos like this every single weekday. Actually, my voice doesn't hurt as bad as I thought it was going to, but we'll see how I feel tomorrow. Um... You can find information about this game in the description below this video. Um, you can find me on social media at the Seat Danger on Twitter and Macedon, on facebook.com slash s15studios, and on s-15studios.itch.io, where you can find all the tabletop games that I've written, including um, Chrome's from the Master's Table, which was released for the Attack and Dethrone God Jam, and Cyborgs and Cigarettes, which was released with the Racial Justice and Equality Bundle. So please play those. Let me know what you think. You can also find everything that I write, including articles and short stories, such as recently released Lord of Vermin, on s-15studios.squarespace.com. Again, please let me know what you think. I'd love to hear from you. As always, hope you enjoyed this video. I'll see you next time.